Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Mr. White has the affirmative that Scripture alone is the infallible rule of the faith for the church. So since he is at the affirmative, he will be going first. Well, good evening. It is uh, great to be here this evening. We have a very small amount of time to cover a lot of ground, I'm afraid. Uh, this is at least the fifth time that I've done this particular topic. In fact, I was uh, debating Trent Horn of Catholic Answers about two months ago on this topic uh, in Houston, Texas, which isn't all that far from here. I drove through Houston to get here. So uh, it is a subject we've dealt with many, many times. I want to be very specific and clear this evening in dealing with sola scriptura, how God speaks to each and every generation consistently. I say that sola scriptura is the default biblical position. It's the default biblical position. Why? Well, let's think about what the Bible says. The Lord Jesus said Scripture is God speaking to each and every individual who reads its words. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 31, where he held men accountable for what had been written 1,400 years before them as if God had spoken it directly to them. Peter wrote that prophetic Scripture does not find its origin even in the prophet, but Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. And Paul directed Timothy to that which is God-breathed so that he might be thoroughly equipped for every good work, 2 Timothy 3.16-17. through 17. You will not find any other source spoken of in these ways. There is nothing like this about traditions or magisteriums or anything else this is how God speaks. This is the default position of the Scriptures themselves. If, in fact, Scripture is ontologically the very speech of God, then we only have to ask whether God has given all that we need for life and godliness through the apostolic witness. That is, is revelation still taking place? And upon answering that question, ask this, is there anything else that we can meaningfully describe as equal to Scripture in nature and hence in authority? If we cannot point to anything else that is the specific revelation of God outside of Scripture, then clearly sola scriptura is the default position of anyone in submission to that very revelation. So do we find Jesus or the apostles directing us to any other ultimate source of authority. Jesus concluded many of his arguments with a citation of a biblical text, but he never concluded his arguments by reference to Jewish traditions or any other alleged source of authority. Are we wiser than the incarnate Lord? This is why we believe Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. It flows therefrom, therefore from this reality that any other religious authority is subject to Scripture, for if Scripture is God speaking, it partakes of God's authority. That makes it the supreme authority. Now, we do not, by insisting upon Scripture's uniqueness, deny that there are subordinate authorities established by God, such as the church's God-ordained officers, elders and deacons. By the way, elder, bishop, and overseer are synonymous in the New Testament. They are not different offices. A bishop is not above an overseer. These are all, uh, or, or an elder, these are all the same office. Likewise, Christians can write documents expressing their beliefs in different contexts so as to aid them in their evangelistic and apologetic tasks. But such documents are always secondary and explanatory and have authority only insofar as they reflect accurately scriptural teachings, and norms. Now, it is often said by Roman Catholic representatives that theirs is the ancient and biblical paradigm, specifically that God's words have been orally transmitted at times in the ancient past, you know, from Adam to Moses, for example, and that prophets spoke God's word without necessarily writing them down in scripture. 
And that, of course, is quite true. Both sides at least formally admit that the office of apostle or prophet ended long ago and that revelation ceased with the last apostle. We can only debate about the situation today, not the situation long ago. So it is claimed that during the days of the apostles, a certain paradigm was established that, it is said, Rome continues to follow to this day, and that those who oppose Rome's authority, claims must prove was changed after the apostles passed from the scene. So you have to prove, well, where does the Bible teach that the paradigm is going to change after the apostles pass from the scene is the challenge that is given. This paradigm, we are told, is made up of scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. Scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. Now, the problem is this requires a massive use of equivocation to work. Why is that? Well, let's consider it. The apostolic and biblical pattern of local churches led by elders slash presbyters cannot realistically be connected to the massive hierarchy of the Roman magisterium, itself, by the way, a very modern term, led by a single bishop, currently Francis. Cardinals, archbishops, and the myriad of offices and designations that make up the modern magisterium is far, far removed from the authority structure ordained by Christ through his apostles. Consider the basic reality that the apostolic paradigm did not include a sacramental priesthood, for example, as a basic point of departure. Allow me here to make a brief aside about the misuse of the gathering in Jerusalem to deal with the Jewish-Gentile controversy recorded in Acts chapter 15. That was a discussion that took place during apostolic times and is recorded for us in inspired scripture. The reason both apostles and elders are included is very obvious. This was the greatest danger facing the infant church, one in which a split would result in a Jewish Christian church and a Gentile Christian church. This is what Paul was so concerned about in writing to the Romans and to the churches of Galatia. So rather than providing a template for future, quote, ecumenical, end quote, councils, with only bishops and no apostles present, Acts 15 only shows that those present were there to provide a consistent testimony to the unity of Jews and Gentiles in the one singular body of Christ. Often, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 is misused at this point, where Paul instructed the Thessalonians, so then, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word, that is, orally, or by epistle from us. But in context, Paul is talking about the gospel. Just look at the preceding two verses, which he delivered to the Thessalonians in two forms, by preaching, when he was with them, Acts chapter 17, and by epistle, which we call 1 Thessalonians. It is eisegesis at its height to attempt to turn this text into a basis for an oral, unrecorded, undocumented, undefined body of revelation passed down outside of Scripture and known only to the magisterium. Interestingly, back in the 90s, Catholic Answers was big on pushing the material, formal sufficiency argument. Uh, I know that because my first debate in August of 1990 uh, was with Catholic Answers representative Jerry Matitix at St. Cyprian's Roman Catholic Church in Long Beach, California. So, but in May of 2022, Jimmy Aiken, doing an open forum program on Catholic Answers Live, indicated that if he had to choose, he would take the partly, partly viewpoint. That is the idea that revelation has been passed on to us partly in the oral and partly in the written. Now, he gave a much longer discussion of that. He can go into that uh, for himself as he has the time to do so. For our purposes this evening, what needs to be recognized is that the challenge to demonstrate that the apostolic paradigm of scripture slash tradition slash magisterium has changed is untenable and fallacious. Tradition is normally used negatively by the apostles, and when it is used positively, it is referring to the singular message of the gospel, not to a secret, hidden, or unwritten and undefined body of non-public revelation. 
which has been used, I simply point out to you, over the past couple of hundred years to define such doctrines as the Immaculate Conception, the Papal Infallibility, and the Bodily Assumption of Mary. The magisterium of the apostles was not made up of popes and cardinals and archbishops, etc., but of elders in the local churches. It was to these men, as Paul demonstrated in Ephesus, that the leadership of the church would be entrusted, not some extra-scriptural body of revelation. Indeed, as Paul said to Timothy, and the things which you have heard from me, how? In the presence of many witnesses and trust, that's related to the term to tradition something, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul specifically excludes secret, undocumented, non-public content, the very essence of the Roman claim that would have to underlie such dogmas as the bodily assumption, immaculate conception, papal infallibility, purgatory, indulgences, and all the rest of the things Rome binds upon men's consciences and proclaims to be a part of the gospel itself, if you're familiar with the terminology de fide dogma. We should likewise keep in mind that Rome's claims regarding a deposit of faith requires them, that, that requires them to deny sola scriptura has not produced an infallible interpretation of the Bible, but a vague claim to have at least defined part of what about six or seven passages in the Bible mean. And one of those, Genesis 3.15, has been infallibly defined and then uninfallibly contradicted by later generations. Rome cannot tell us the content of tradition, nor can it tell us even how many infallible councils have been found. There's argument about that. In fact, Rome did not infallibly define the canon of Scripture until April of 1546. That's a long time after the last apostle died. So we must recognize that this debate has always been between two ultimate sources of authority. Rome claims a tripartite form, but in reality, Rome is the final authority, period. Rome defines what is and what is not Scripture, and when convenient, what you have to at least believe Scripture says in a few places, and what it simply cannot mean in others. Likewise, she pretends to identify apostolic tradition in the myriads of differing views expressed in patristic sources, rejecting the mountain of testimony that goes against her particular claims. In conclusion, we must also recognize the vital importance of this debate. Rome demands men and women to believe things the apostles never taught as part of the gospel, but you must believe them today. And she does so because she rejects sola scriptura. Today, with Francis seeking to make fundamental changes in the Roman Catholic Church, we see the inevitable result of the denial of sola scriptura, the loss of the ability to restrain such forces. I submit to you that the reason we see such havoc in Rome today, the reason we, you see all of Africa saying, nope, we ain't, we ain't following that. Nope, we're not, we're not going to do uh, that thing over there. The reason you see this kind of thing happening is because since you've denied sola scriptura, you've cut the Roman Catholic Church off from the only sure voice of Christ and replaced that voice with the church. That's the problem in denying sola scriptura. To deny sola scriptura requires, honestly, the demonstration of Christ-ordained revelation that is God-breathed in some source other than the Bible today. Not that it existed orally at one point, but that it only exists orally today. That can with certainty be demonstrated to have come from Christ and his apostles. No such source has ever been produced, and especially today in light of the papacy of Francis, we can say with confidence that no such source is in the possession of the Roman church. It is only of Scripture, only of Scripture can it ever be said, have you not read what God spoke to you saying? And so I want you to think about that. Jesus was arguing with the Sadducees, and he said to them, quoting from the Pentateuch, which was written 1,400 years earlier, have you not read what God spoke to you saying? He didn't say, have you not heard? He said, have you not read 
what God spoke to you. He held men in his day accountable to the content of Scripture as if God has spoken it directly to them. There is nothing else in the possession of the church that has that level of clarity and authority because Scripture is God speaking. That is why Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. Thank you very much for your attention. Looks like we're ready to rock and roll. Howdy, folks. How you doing? Good. Now, um, our resolution tonight, as you can see, this was picked by, uh, by James, is Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. And that's helpful, but it doesn't really give us a full sense of what sola scriptura is and how it functions. Fortunately, James is here to help us out again. Because in his 1996 book, The Roman Catholic Controversy, under the heading, What Sola Scriptura Is, he tells us the following. One, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, simply stated, is that the scriptures alone are sufficient to function as the regula fide, the infallible rule of faith for the church. Two, all that one must believe, and by the way, the two words in red, must and is, that's his emphasis, so all that one must believe to be a Christian is found in Scripture and in no other source. Three, that which is not found in Scripture, either directly or by necessary implication, is not binding upon the Christian. So let's remember those points. Now, I have noticed in researching this topic, it seems like James has changed his position at least a little bit on one question. Maybe he has, maybe not. He can clarify that for us later. But in the Roman Catholic controversy, he said that the Bible claims to be the sole and sufficient infallible rule of faith for the Christian church. But three years later, in 1999, on his website, he wrote that Protestants do not assert that sola scriptura is valid, is a valid concept during times of revelation. It's a canard to point to times of revelation and say, see, sola scriptura doesn't work there. Of course it doesn't, he says. So that's a very interesting change. Uh, It would mean that none of the verses that Protestants commonly appeal to in support of sola scriptura actually teach sola scriptura. If sola scriptura was not in use, in the apostolic period, then there are no verses telling Christians in that period to use it. So the Bible doesn't claim to be the sole and sufficient infallible rule of faith for the Christian church. Instead, sola scriptura would have to be a post-biblical inference. And we can see that in the uh, debate that uh, James did a couple of months ago with my colleague Trent Horn. During part of that, he reasoned this way. He said they, meaning first century Christians, had scripture and the apostles. The apostles are gone. Okay, that's a post-biblical premise because the Bible never says they're going to go away. What do we have now? We have scripture, meaning scripture only. Well, that's another post-biblical premise. Therefore, he concludes, they, meaning the scriptures, form the only infallible rule of faith for the church today. Well, let's talk about how authority actually worked in the Bible. And it's the same for both the Old and the New Testament, but I'm going to focus on the New Testament here because I don't have time to go into how it worked the same way in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus gave a bunch of new revelation. You know, like when he said, Uh, all the stones in the temple, they're all going to be torn down. That was new revelation. That was not in the Old Testament. And since Jesus never wrote anything, he gave this new revelation in oral form. But he wanted it passed on to others. And so he told his apostles and certain select others to transmit this divine revelation to others via preaching in oral form. And he said, for example, if they hear you, they hear me. If they reject you, they reject me. And the one who sent me, 
Also, some of this revelation, although as we're going to see, it doesn't look like all of it, some of this revelation was later written down in authoritative scriptures. So that's how we see things working at the time of Jesus. Now, I notice, I know that the term tradition is kind of sensitive in Protestant circles, and there's a, there's a reasonable basis for that, number one, because it tends to be used almost exclusively negatively in Protestant circles, but also because there are passages in which the uh, scriptures warn about tradition, where the scripture does speak of tradition in a negative way. And whenever that happens, it is always human tradition that's under discussion. It's basically in two passages in the Gospel, and one in Galatians, and one in Colossians, and not much else. But balancing that, there are positive references to tradition in the New Testament. And whenever it's positive, it's talking about apostolic tradition, not some Jewish tradition from before the time of Christ that Pharisees were into, but traditions that were being passed on to the Christian community by the apostles. So, for example, Paul commends the Corinthians for keeping the traditions just as he delivered them to them. He also commands the Thessalonians to hold to the traditions they were taught, whether they were taught orally or in writing. And he commands the Thessalonians to stay away from anyone who's not living according to the traditions that he had given them. So when tradition is spoken of negatively, you'll notice it's human. When it's spoken positively, spoken of positively, it's apostolic. But then there's also a question of how do you interpret Scripture and tradition, because they can be read more than one way. For example, in the first century, there was a dispute about, do you need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian? <clears throat> well, God willed a council to authoritatively interpret previous scripture and tradition as related to circumcision and Christian identity. And we know God willed it because Paul says that he went up to this council because of a revelation. God said, you get on up there and talk to the church in Jerusalem. But the council included, as James admitted, more than just the apostles. It also included the elders in Jerusalem. So this isn't a council limited to the apostles. And there's nothing in the text that says the elders were just there as witnesses. They didn't get to participate in the discussion. Doesn't say that. Now, interestingly, God didn't give any new revelation. During this council, he didn't give anybody a vision, he didn't speak to anybody, but the Holy Spirit guided the council so that it ended up making an inerrant decision and it spoke with divine authority. That's why at the end of the council, the council fathers say it has seemed good to us, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And so this council was, by God's will, exercising a teaching authority, or in Latin, a magisterium. So we see the elements of the apostolic paradigm that James referred to. It in, in the first century, as the apostles were preaching, their, Christians were expected to derive their doctrine from apostolic scripture, which is divine revelation in the form of authoritative writings that the apostles had authorized, and that would include the Old Testament, because they said, yeah, all those Old Testament scriptures, those are authoritative. Also, it included apostolic tradition, which is divine revelation in the form of teachings passed on orally alongside scripture. And it included a magisterium, a teaching authority instituted by God to authoritatively interpret the divine revelation in scripture and in tradition. Should we follow the apostolic paradigm. Well, the apostolic paradigm was divinely authorized, and what is divinely authorized is binding unless God makes new provisions. Therefore, any replacement for the apostolic paradigm must be divinely authorized. But as we're going to see, sola scriptura is not divinely authorized, so we should stick with the apostolic paradigm today. Put it another way, Christians should follow what we know Jesus willed for his followers unless he tells us otherwise. Christ willed that his church use the apostolic paradigm, 
and he willed that his church extend beyond the, post, beyond the apostolic age. So unless we get a revelation somewhere telling us otherwise, we should use the apostolic paradigm that Jesus willed throughout the history of the church. And you know what? That's what Christians did do until the Reformation. The apostolic paradigm was used by Christians in the apostolic age, and it was then passed on to and used by later Christians. In his February debate, uh, James acknowledged that this paradigm of scripture, tradition, and magisterium is used by the Catholic Church, by Greek, Russian, and Ukrainian Orthodox churches, by the Assyrian Church of the East, and by other Oriental Christian groups. Now, these different groups aren't all in full communion with each other. They have differences, uh, but they are all maintaining the same basic paradigm of scripture, tradition, and magisterium. All of these groups have simply maintained the paradigm. They haven't always applied it correctly, but they've maintained the paradigm they inherited from the apostles. Sola Scriptura, thus, is a rejection of the apostolic paradigm that was popularized at the Protestant Reformation. Well, what does the New Testament say about the age we're living in, about the post-apostolic age? Well, it says a number of things. Here are three pertinent ones. The first one you could quibble with, but most Christians have discerned that when Jesus tells the apostles that the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth, that that's a promise for the whole church. The Holy Spirit's not going to abandon the church at some point. It's going to continue to guide the church. What's not debatable is what Jesus says in the Great Commission, which is that he will guide the church as it teaches unto the end of the world. He says, go make disciples, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you all the days until the end of the world. So he's going to guide the church in its teaching until the end of the world. And as St. Paul is about to die in his last epistle, he tells Timothy to take the oral tradition that he has received from Paul in the presence of many witnesses, so it's not some secret Gnostic tradition, and entrust it to other people who will teach other people. And so since he's planning to die, Paul's envisioning this passing on of apostolic tradition happening in the post-apostolic age. And he names the first four generations of it. His own apostolic generation, Timothy's generation, the generation Timothy will teach, and the generation that they teach. So the New Testament expects us to pass down apostolic tradition after the apostles. And guess what? They did. We do. Contrary to James's claims, we do have extra-biblical apostolic tradition today. Here are just four apostolic traditions that are not mentioned in Scripture that I've picked because we agree on them. First, there aren't going to be any new apostles. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, you know, Paul was not an eyewitness of Jesus, but Jesus appeared to him and taught him and appointed him an apostle. He could have kept doing that all the way through church history. But we know as a matter of apostolic tradition, because it's not in the Bible, that the apostles stopped. Also, we know there's not going to be any new public revelation. Public revelation meaning revelation that is binding on the whole Christian public. That stopped with the death of the last apostle. Consequently, there are not going to be any new scriptures. And... Consequently, the New Testament consists of only 27 books. We can't add to it now. So the claim that we don't have any surviving apostolic tradition or that apostolic tradition is unknown to anybody but Rome, that's just false. There's four points of it that we agree on. Does God sometimes guide the magisterium into infallible decisions? Well, uh, it's true that in the, in the mid-first century, elder and bishop were the same thing. But that shifted by the end of the first century, as Ignatius of Antioch mentions, and later second century figures like Irenaeus of Lyon say the apostles were the ones who made that change. They instituted the difference. And we see that when they met together in councils, the magisterium was led by God to inerrant decisions like Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is one person, and so forth. Some of these not being some of these decisions not being made until almost 700 years after the time of Christ. So we see God guiding the church into making inerrant decisions 
hundreds of years after the time of Christ. Now, in order to prove sola scriptura, you would ultimately need to show verses that teach it in one way or another. Sola scriptura holds that all teachings must be taught explicitly or implicitly in scripture. Sola scriptura is a teaching. Therefore, so if sola scriptura is true, it must be taught in scripture. But it's not taught in scripture, so it's false. It's self-refuting. James has acknowledged it was not in use in the first century, and consequently, none of the passages in the New Testament are teaching it. It's a post-biblical inference based on false premises like we don't have any apostolic tradition anymore. So to just summarize the apostolic paradigm, was Jesus' will for his first followers? It was never rescinded. He promised he and the Holy Spirit would guide the church forever. The New Testament speaks of passing down apostolic tradition in the post-apostolic age, and God guided the magisterium into inerrant decisions centuries later. Whereas, sola scriptura was not Jesus' will for his first followers, is never taught in the New Testament, is based on false post-apostolic premises, such as we don't have any apostolic tradition today, and it's self-refuting because it fails to meet its own test. Thank you very much, folks. All right. Now, you will notice that I addressed pretty much all of Mr. Aiken's presentation in my opening presentation. And so what we have gotten is a clear example of equivocation. Let me give you an example. Uh, he said, he referred to apostolic tradition as teachings taught alongside Scripture and said that the apostles were referring to this. What the apostles were referring to was the preaching of the gospel. The gospel is recorded for us in the New Testament. And so when the apostles aren't here any longer, what they taught is found for us in Scripture. When I debated Mitch Pacwa on the, this subject, actually, I just realized this is my sixth uh, debate on the subject. When I asked Mitch Pacwa, has the Roman Catholic Church defined a single word that Jesus ever spoke that's not found in Scripture? He said no. Has the Roman Catholic Church defined infallibly a single word that any apostle ever said that's not found in Scripture? He said no. So how do we know what they taught? It's in Scripture. How do we know what Jesus taught? It's in Scripture. Sola Scriptura is relevant to the church after the apostles because you have to have a Scriptura to have a sola first. So as I said in my opening, we have to talk about where we are today, not what was happening during the time of the Scripturation, which includes the Acts chapter 15 council. So if you keep a close, close attention... Look at the quote-unquote apostolic traditions that he talked about. Uh, he talked about, uh, for example, no more apostles and no more books of Scripture. Read Hebrews chapter 1. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. He did these things in the past. Now, in Christ, we have this conclusion, this finishing, and that's how the early fathers understood what Hebrews chapter 1 was talking about as well. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, for example, he said that we are to teach these apostolic traditions to Timothy, and he's to teach it to the next person, and the next person, so on and so forth. That's true, but these are not traditions that exist outside of Scripture. What did Paul himself say? What you have heard me teach in the presence of many witnesses. You see, folks, you need to understand, the reason this is important is that Mr. Aiken represents a religious group that will tell you that you must believe that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven. It's a part of the gospel. It's de fide. I've debated Roman Catholic apologists who have said, you have as much warrant to believe in the bodily assumption of Mary as you have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how certain it is. And he worked for Catholic Answers, by the way, at that time. So if that is the case, and remember, we have the Immaculate Conception, Perpetual Virginity of Mary, uh, uh, such doctrines as purgatory and indulgences and uh, papal infallibility, all these things, are they apostolic traditions? You see, Mr. Aiken gave us the real easy ones. How about the ones the apostles really had to teach? But the reality is church history teaches us nobody back then knew anything about it. 
No one was preaching about the bodily assumption of Mary. No one believed that the Pope in Rome was the infallible. Well, the Pope in Rome might have thought he was infallible, but nobody else did. Ask Augustine, ask Cyprian, ask the number of people who contradicted that kind of thinking down through church history. That's why it's so important that if you're going to say that these apostolic traditions were taught by the apostles and not recorded in Scripture, you've got to give us evidence. And Rome can't do it. Rome can't tell us what tradition is. Rome can't tell us what the deposit of faith is upon which she has defined so many of these dogmas. He said that I admitted, for example, that there were other, well, cer- certainly there are churches, the uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, if I was debating an Eastern Orthodox person, I'd be talking about their traditions. I'd be talking about the Second Nicene Council and the absurdities that in- it introduced and, and how that was completely contrary to what had come in the hundreds of years before that. I'd be using different examples by beholding them to the exact same standard And that is, I want to know what Jesus and his apostles taught, and the only way we can know that today is what is found in Scripture. We cannot go outside of Scripture to get that. So, uh, Mr. Aiken said, well, when human tradition is referred to, yes, that's, that's that's a negative thing, but you need to remember something. In Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7, when Jesus talked about human tradition, and he said we are to test it by Scripture, the scribes and Pharisees believed that the traditions that they were following, watch this, follow this, had been delivered by Moses and passed down orally outside of Scripture. They believed they were divine traditions. They believed they came from God, but that they weren't found in Scripture. They were passed down orally through the Jewish magisterium. Did Jesus bow to that? He most certainly did not. And in fact, he told us to test any proclaimed tradition, even from people who say this came from God, by what? By Scripture. So what is the apostolic paradigm? Is it a magisterium with Peter at the head? By the way, in Acts chapter 15, in Acts chapter 15, not only do they quote Scripture as the foundation, by the way, did you notice if you read it? Peter didn't run that. James did. James made the final decision. Peter was not considered the head of all Christians or anything like that at this particular point in time. But when you look at what is being said in those contexts, you discover that the, context, the idea of tradition, when it is used positively, is simply talking about the gospel. That's what Paul, when he said to the Thessalonians, I have taught you one body of truth when I was with you by preaching, And when I wrote you the epistle, and you're holding to that, and I commend you for that, how do you and I obey that today? By believing in traditions you can't find a single shred of evidence for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and in fact can find all sorts of early writers who contradicted those things you now call tradition? You see, it's sola scriptura versus sola ecclesia. And when the church decides, We get to define what Scripture is, what it means, what tradition is, and what it means. You have no way of correcting that. You have no way of fixing the problem we have with Francis today and what's happening in Rome. That's what the issue is tonight. Keep your eye on the ball. Don't allow for redefinition. I could go for another 30 seconds because he did, but I won't. I'll stop. Thank you. Anytime you want another 30, James, I got your back covered. <clears throat> so, so there's a lot in there that I would love to respond to that I simply don't have time to because James is engaging in a debater's tactic that's sometimes called overloading, where you just throw one charge after another, after another, after another, and you make claims about them that your opponent has no chance to respond to. So in such a circumstance, the only option for an ethical debater is to not be distracted and to just point out what one's opponent is doing, and then move on and stick to basic principles. So that's what I'm going to do. Here are some things that don't prove sola scriptura. One of them is passages from Jesus or elsewhere in the New Testament that speak of the scriptures as inspired, infallible, or inerrant, because those passages don't prove there aren't other things that don't have those qualities. Also, Jesus or the New Testament expects some Jews to know some scriptures. Well, that doesn't prove sola scriptura, and in fact, there are no passages showing that he expected all Jews to know all scriptures. In fact, there was disagreement among Jews about what the canon was at the time. 
Also, it doesn't prove sola scriptura if Jesus appeals to the scriptures as authoritative, because that doesn't mean there weren't other authorities. Or it doesn't prove it if Jesus uh, directs some Jews to scripture to settle a question, because all that shows is that scripture is sufficient to settle that question, not all questions. And as a bonus, the claim that Jesus never directed anyone to anything but scripture as a final authority is false. He also directed people to apostolic tradition, such as when he said, if they hear you, they hear me. And if they reject you, they reject me and the one who sent me. So he was saying, you're rejecting God. If, you, if they're rejecting God, if they reject this oral tradition that you're delivering to them. Is Sola Scriptura a doctrine, though? That's an important question. Now, I made an argument earlier. If Sola Scriptura holds that all doctrines must be taught by Scripture alone, explicitly or implicitly, then if Sola Scriptura is a doctrine, it's going to need to be taught in Scripture alone. And James hasn't done anything to counter that. And it's universally agreed in the Protestant church that sola scripture is a doctrine. I could cite all kinds of authors for that, but I'll just cite three passages from the Roman Catholic controversy alone, where James himself refers to sola scriptura as a doctrine. And there are dozens of references to it as a doctrine on his website. Furthermore, we could approach the subject this way. Uh, is sola scriptura something that Christians are supposed to believe? Well, James himself told us that all that one must believe to be a Christian is found in Scripture and no other source. That which is not found in Scripture, either directly or by necessary implication, is not binding on the Christian. So unless sola scriptura can be documented either directly or by necessary implication from Scripture, it's not going to be binding on y'all. And James even admits that sola scriptura needs to be supported by Scripture. If he didn't think that, he wouldn't be quoting Jesus and other passages trying to support it. So if one says, well, it's not a doctrine or it's a doctrine, but it's not the kind that needs to meet its own test, then that's just an ad hoc move designed to save an otherwise failing proposal. What about inspiration? James made a, uh, has, on various occasions, talked a lot about inspiration, and he sometimes speaks as if being God-breathed or inspired is something that is needed for something to be a binding belief on Christians. But this is not true. Christians should believe anything that is true, not you know, anything that's not in error. Therefore, inerrant decisions, inerrant truths should be believed, infallibly taught truths should be believed. And James even admits this by phrasing our resolution tonight as Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith, not the sole inspired rule of faith. So I don't need to show that something is inspired for it to be authoritative for the Christian community. I only need to show that it's inerrant or otherwise taught under the gift of infallibility. And I've already done that because I've already shown us four apostolic traditions that we agree on that continue to exist in the church. But what is God breathed? I'm going to be brief about this, but in 2 Timothy it says, in a common translation, all Scripture is inspired by God. Really, all Scripture should be every Scripture, because in Greek that phrase is pasagraphe and Pasa means each, every, and any when it's an adjective with a noun lacking the definite article. So really, this should be every scripture is God-breathed. And scripture is said to be God-breathed because it carries God's word, which is metaphorically carried by his breath, just like our breath carries our words. So anything that carries God's word is God-breathed in the original sense of the term. Later theology developed a more restricted meaning, but in the usage that was there in Paul's day, anything that carried God's word was God-breathed. And so the word of God is God-breathed. Well, you find out some interesting stuff if you do a study of the phrase word of God. In the Bible, it appears 46 times. In no cases is the phrase word of God a synonym for scripture. None. None. 
In three cases, it's used to refer to a message contained in Scripture, but not to the Scripture itself. In two cases, it refers to God's creative word. In one passage, it refers to Jesus. In 11 cases, it refers to a divine revelation newly given in the form of oral tradition or to a past one not limited to Scripture. And in 29 cases, it refers to oral transmission of past divine revelation, and all but one of those is in the New Testament. So it's referring to apostolic tradition. Overwhelmingly, the phrase, word of God, refers to apostolic tradition. And therefore, apostolic tradition is divinely inspired in the sense that St. Paul is talking about. So don't look for dodges like, show me something else that's inspired. I already have. I've shown you four. Talk to you soon. Okay. Um, The nature of debate is that you deal with a lot of different topics. I resent the idea that I'm engaging in some type of a tactic of overload. I just invite you to go back and listen to any debate I ever did with Catholic Answers representatives, if you want an example of overload from the other side, allegedly. I find it fascinating that Jimmy already has his slides for rebuttals. How do you do that if you don't know what the other person is going to be saying specifically in response to you? So instead of engaging with what I'm saying in this debate, well, you wrote this in a book. Okay, fine. I've answered the things that are in my book. But the idea of, well, I'm just going to continue on with my presentation, I find very, very, very interesting uh, in light of the uh, allegation that I'm sort of trying to overload someone and anything like that. I want you to catch how many times apostolic tradition is being used in an equivocal way. Okay? So apostolic tradition is what Jesus teaches the apostles and what the apostles teach. That's called the gospel. It is found in Scripture, it's defined in Scripture, it's defended in Scripture. Rome uses apostolic tradition as the basis for binding dogmas upon your soul, such as the bodily assumption of Mary and papal infallibility. You need to be able to recognize the difference between these things because it's real easy to defend the, 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 the easy one. Well, it's, you know, we all agree that, that the revelations ended. But we don't all agree that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven, do we? And yet, allegedly, it's all based upon apostolic tradition. I say to you, the apostles never taught anyone anything about about bodily assumption, about papal infallibility, about immaculate conceptions, about purgatory, about indulgences, or any of those other things that Rome has bound de fide upon people's souls. And if you want to say they did, then you've got to be able to prove it. Mr. Aiken has not given us any example of something that is theanoustos, God breathed. He said, well, God's word can be this and God's word can be that. But what Paul said to Timothy is, if you want to be prepared to perform every good work in the church, then you turn to that which is theanoustos. And I'm at least thankful, I have to thank Jimmy Aiken for not using the argument that Trent Horn used recently that theanustos doesn't really mean God breathed, it means life-giving. I am thankful that at least he didn't go that direction. That's an improvement from my perspective. But it means God breathed. It is uniquely found in Scripture, and you cannot find anything today, including in the Vatican, anything that is properly described as God breathed. And that means that that which is taught by those who are using sources that are not God-breathed, and binding those upon Christians. I ask every one of you, take the time to go back and read the statements that define bodily assumption, immaculate conception, and even papal infallibility. Read the statements themselves. They will say, if you even think otherwise than this, you are anathema. You are anathema. So this is, this is not, you can't just simply say, well, you know, if we have something about, you know, there aren't going to be any more apostles, uh, that's the same thing as the apostles passing on this doctrine and teaching orally outside of Scripture. There is no evidence that that happened. Rome has never defined a single word that Jesus the apostles said outside of Scripture. Only Scripture is theanoustos, theanoustos. 
Only scripture is God speaking, and that's why it is the default position for any Christian who wants to follow what God would have us to believe. Thank you. So come back tomorrow night because you're going to want to know what anathema means. In the meantime, let's talk about uh, James's repeated assertion that when the apostles refer to tradition, they're only referring to the gospel. Okay, one passage that is in, or one book that is informative on that subject is Second Thessalonians. Now, um, if you want to assert that apostolic tradition is nothing but the gospel, you're going to need to have evidence for that. You can't just make an assertion as if it's true. How do we know that apostolic tradition contained nothing but the gospel? How do we know it didn't include other stuff? And how do we know it all got written down? Those are important questions. So, looking at what we know about Thessalonica, well, Paul only spent three Sabbaths in, Thess in Thessalonica. He was there for less than four weeks before he had to leave. And so he didn't have time to give them a full course of Christian doctrine. Could he have taught them the basics of the gospel? Sure. But then he's going to want them to be receptive to other apostolic teachings that aren't part of the gospel itself, because there's more to Christian doctrine than just the gospel. Did he teach them other things, though, orally as part of apostolic tradition that are not part of the gospel and that are not mentioned in 2 Thessalonians? Yes, he did. And we can show that because he reminds the Thessalonians that they already know what is restraining the man of lawlessness, this prophetic figure. And he tells them, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? So he had told them, as part of oral tradition, a prophetic fact that something that he identified is restraining the man of lawlessness, but it's not mentioned in Scripture. He doesn't say what it is. And so the famed Baptist scholar F.F. F. Bruce says they, the Thessalonians, because they had been told, knew what this was. Later readers are at a disadvantage compared with them and have to guess, because it is not obvious from the text itself. Now, the church fathers got your back. They have some ideas about what this was that they believed had been passed down to them. And maybe one day one of those will be established as true because the magisterium, that's part of its job. But uh, it nevertheless remains the case that apostolic tradition is not identical with the gospel. And we can show that from the text of Scripture itself. Now, briefly, let me back up and talk about this other passage in 2 Timothy, where uh, Paul is talking about Scripture. One of the things that James regularly does is he focuses on the final two verses of this passage, which deal with Scripture. But actually, <clears throat> Paul is pointing Timothy to a double appeal to both apostolic tradition and apostolically approved Scriptures. He says, as for you... Continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. So that's apostolic tradition he got from Paul. How from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which would be the Old Testament at the time, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Now, they won't get you all the way to Jesus Christ unless you hear the apostolic preaching. So you need apostolic tradition in order to be able to correctly read the Old Testament and apply it to Christ. He then talks about how every scripture is God-breathed and so forth, but notice that's the back half of a double appeal to tradition and to scripture. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, we are going to take a five-minute break. We're going to reset the stage for cross-examination. You need to turn in your Q&A cards at this time. The three pastors, if you will come and stand up here, you can hand your cards to them at 7.40 p.m. We will resume. Please take your seat, and we're going to get started. So for this portion of the debate, it is cross-examination. In my opinion, this is the part of the debate that is the most informative because each questioner gets to
question the other. So since Dr. White has the affirmative, he will have 10 minutes to cross-examine Mr. Aiken, and then Mr. Aiken will have 10 minutes to cross-examine Mr. White. Uh, during this time, the one asking the questions, uh, the questioner is just to ask questions, and the other is to respond. It is the questioner's time, so if he needs to move on and ask another question, he has the right to do that. And if we'll start the 10-minute timer, when that happens. Um, you made reference to the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians, and then I think you said maybe someday they'll tell us what it is. Um, so can you tell us on, from uh, apostolic tradition who the restrainer is in 2 Thessalonians? One of the key proposals is that it is the restraining force of Roman law. Yeah. However, that's not a guarantee, and the magisterium hasn't yet ruled on that question, but that is one of the, one of the uh, traditions that is out there. So, uh, but you don't know infallibly what that passage is referring to? No, because the church has never had an occasion to infallibly define it. It doesn't do that willy-nilly, only in special circumstances. And what would those special circumstances be? Well, for example, if the uh, man of lawlessness was running around and we needed to identify him and the fact he had come, that might provoke such a response. Okay, uh, do you believe that fiducia supplicants is a function of apostolic tradition? Um, I think that fiducia supplicants does not, when read correctly, uh, does not contradict any elements of apostolic tradition, but it is a, it goes beyond apostolic tradition. It goes beyond apostolic tradition. Yeah. So the church has the authority to go beyond apostolic tradition? Sure. Like, for example, um, authorizing the use of air conditioners in churches in southern Louisiana. That's beyond apostolic tradition, but the church can authorize that. Do you really think I that... I think most people are glad it has. Yeah, I, I would agree, but do you really think that that's parallel to fiducia supplicants and the tremendous controversy it has engendered in regards to the obvious reality of the Pope's view of homosexuality? I think that the Pope's view, I think you're misreading the Pope's view of homosexuality, um, and I don't understand exactly what you've asked me. Can you restate the question? Well, it just seemed to me that uh, air conditioners and the idea of blessings of irregular relationships, especially in light of the synod of synodality, is a really long stretch that's not appropriate. Wouldn't you agree? Um, I think that in both cases, we have the church doing something that is not prohibited by either scripture or apostolic tradition. You may have different valuations in terms of which ones you approve, uh, or, but I don't see a difference in principle in what's happening here. Okay. And, I, and I frankly think you're misreading the situation, perhaps because you haven't followed the Catholic press on this closely enough, but giving a blessing, it's, it has been clarified that this does not involve giving a blessing to a union, I know that. but to two individuals. I understand, I understand that. Uh, the, uh, the Pope has also said recently that uh, uh, two men in a homosexual relationship are living out their love. Do I have the right as a Christian holding the scriptures to hold that kind of statement to a biblical standard and reject it? You have a right to hold that statement and any other to a biblical standard. You have a right to reject it if it is actually contradictory. Right. And that would require my interpretation of that which is theonustos, correct? You would need to correctly interpret uh, Scripture and what it requires, yes. And if I am to correctly interpret, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, uh, that says that arsenokoitai... Uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, do you believe there is an apostolic tradition outside of 1 Corinthians that defines what arsenokoitai means? No, I think the term is fairly straightforward. I, I, I would agree. Um, does it then not bother you that many of the people uh, at the Synod of Synodality uh, were lecturing the bishops on the need to be inclusive of LGBTQ individuals? Yes, just like it uh, bothers me that some people in the Southern Baptist Conference and elsewhere in the Protestant community have lectured traditionalists in your communities as well about how they need to reinterpret various biblical passages. Do you see those as parallel in light of the claim uh, 
that the synod and synodality is a function of the magisterium, is it not? Actually, it's not. It's not? No. Uh, it, it, its results only gain magisterial authority if they are approved by the Pope. And if the Pope, who uh, chose all the people that are speaking at the Synod of Synodality, uh, approves that statement, uh, or whatever would come out of that Synod, then it would be a function of the magisterium, yes? It would be part of the Pope's ordinary magisterium, yes, but there are people who I'm sure spoke at the Acts 15 Council that were in favor of circumcision being required for all Christians, and I would say they were misadvising that synod as well. So just because you can point to some people at a synod and say, oh, there are some people here saying stuff they shouldn't, there certainly were at First Nicaea where the divinity of Christ was defined, that doesn't invalidate this as an overall exercise of the magisterium. So, but let's say, theoretically, that the synod of synodality produces a statement um, that uh, is uh, well, representative of the positions of the people that have been placed there by the Pope himself, and the Pope approves of it. Uh, will you then uh, accept that as a valid interpretation of biblical scripture? Well, I never comment on uh, hypotheticals until I can see what they say. Um, however, I can sketch principles, and Catholics are required to agree with anything that the church has taught infallibly. Um, the church recognizes that apart from infallible teaching, there can be situations where a person is, is unable in good conscience to agree with a non-infallible teaching. And so if the synod or any other non-infallible document came out that said something that looked really problematic, I'd have to look at it carefully and say, okay, well, verify this is non-infallible, and it will be because synod documents are never infallible. Um, but then I'd have to look at it and say, does this actually disagree with something that I'm required to believe elsewhere? And if it does, then I would have to say, well, this is, this is, this is non-infallible. It's a mistake in this case. So you're required to interpret uh, not only scripture, but um, ancient creeds, ancient councils, magisterial documents. Do you really think that gives you a higher level of certainty uh, than a person who is going directly to the scriptures? Uh, I... The situations are very disanalogous. Um, I'm trying to do my best to. I was speaking generally. I'm, I'm leaving fiducia supplicants and the synod and synodality behind. Okay. You're saying you were speaking generally, and you were saying that in general, uh, you have the responsibility and the right to disagree with non infallible statements. In principle, in limited circumstances, yes. Limited circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Um, does everyone agree on what is and what is not infallible statements? Uh, scholars typically have a great deal of consensus on this. Okay. Is there, a, is there an absolute consensus, for example, on how many infallible councils there have been? In, in terms of ecumenical councils, that whether or not they exercised infallibility, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's pretty much universally agreed upon in the Catholic Church. So there's Church. no, there's, you, you, you don't, you're not cognizant of any disagreement uh, as to whether a certain council was functioning infallibly. There's a list somewhere I'm, that I'm, tells I'm you that. I'm distinguishing between the exercise of infallibility and the capacity for infallibility. All ecumenical councils have the capacity to teach infallibly. Not all of them have actually exercised it. Would you consider indulgentiarum doctrina an infallibly uh, defined statement? No, of course not. It's a, it's a, it's... Uh, the Pope doesn't remotely use the language in that necessary. This is a document that came out from Paul VI in the 1960s. Okay, uh, in regards to the subject of indulgences. But would you accept it as having doctrinal authority for the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you believe that you have given examples of something that is theanustos, that is not found. Well, let me back, back that, that up. You heard what I said about uh, Mitch Pacwa? Yeah. Uh, would you agree with Mitch Pacwa that the church has never defined a single word that Jesus or the apostles ever said that is actually not found in Scripture? If by word you mean a verbatim quotation, 
I would agree. If you mean, has it ever infallibly defined a teaching that came from them that is not found in Scripture? I would say it has done that. And you would use the examples you used before? Among others, I use those only because we believe in them. Right. And so, uh, very quickly, uh, do you, do you, can you point to anything in the first five centuries of the church that gives the reality that the apostles delivered to the Thessalonians the foundation of the modern Marian dogmas? Uh, to the Thessalonians specifically? Or well, to that's the what Second Thessalonians says. Generally? Well, Second Thessalonians says what was delivered to you. That was to the church, right? To the yes, but the principles apply to all the Christian churches. Okay. I, as I said, we have very limited. Paul spoke spoke to the Thessalonians for only a very limited time, and we don't have a complete record of all he told them. But do I have evidence from the church fathers from the first five centuries supporting the basic Marian doctrines? Absolutely, I do. Look in my book. The fathers know best. It's up for sale yes. out there on the table. All right, time has expired for the first ten minutes. I wanted to allow. Uh, Mr. Aiken, to answer that question, uh, Mr. White got it in just before the end of his time. I want to give you sufficient opportunity to answer his last question. Now we'll set the timer for 10 minutes for Mr. Aiken to ask questions of Mr. White. Okay, uh, so James, you've acknowledged that Sola Scriptura was not operational during the apostolic period. When did it become obligatory for Christians? In what century? When you had a Scriptura. You can't, you can't even have a discussion of sola scriptura or prima scriptura or anything else until you have a scriptura. So when did that happen? What century? Well, that would be after the death of the last apostle. Wh which century? I'm not asking for no, a relative I don't, I don't think anybody, I don't think, I don't think John made it to 140 or anything like that. So uh, that would be at the end of the first century. Okay, so you think that Sola Scriptura was obligatory for Christians beginning in the second century? I believe that Christians recognized that they needed to hear what Christ's voice said and that they found that in Scripture, yes. Do you acknowledge that authors from this period also rec claim to recognize Christ's voice in the tradition passed down from the apostles? Uh, depending on what they're making reference to. So in, re in reference to traditions regarding such things as how to baptize um, or, you know, three times forward or three times backwards or that, that goes on for quite some time. But there is a difference. Irenaeus, for example, when he speaks of apostolic tradition, defines it as there is one God, the maker of heaven and earth. Okay. Now, that's obviously let's, a sub-biblical... Let's not get... Because I want to stay focused on this issue. I haven't yet gotten... A clear answer from you to was sola scriptura binding on Christians in the second century? Do you, unless I missed it, did you agree to that that it became binding on Christians in the second century? Well, a couple things. Uh, I think it's very important to allow history to speak here. Not everyone in the second century had the entirety of the New Testament. Sure. So Justin Martyr, for example, shows next to no familiarity with the Apostle Paul. I'm not sure what your theology would look like without Paul, but mine would be very, very different than, than what it currently is. So there is the same period of development of understanding of what the apostles have delivered that you have in the Old Testament. So uh, my, my response to that is you have the exact same situation that was faced by the Jewish people during the intertestamental period. And by the time of Jesus, Jesus could hold men accountable to what? The scripture, not to Jewish okay. tradition. Okay. Um, on your, I'd love to explore this further with you, but we only have seven and a half minutes. Um, in, your, in your book and on your website, there are dozens of references to sola scriptura as a doctrine mm -hmm. or teaching. Just Doctrina is just the Latin word for teaching. Do you still recognize sola scriptura as a doctrine, and would it need to pass its own test in order to be successful? Of course it's a doctrine, but it is a doctrine that is different than, say, resurrection. Mm -hmm. Resurrection is a historical reality, and so it's taught in Scripture what it meant, why it happened, who did it, when it happened, so on and so forth. Does Sola, Sola Scriptura, Scriptura need, does it need to meet its own test in order to be binding on Christians? So allow me to, to finish the last uh, uh, question first. Sola Scriptura speaks to the nature of ultimate authority. And so, as I said in my opening statement, the only passages of Scripture that address ultimate authority where God is speaking, place that within the pages of Scripture for us today. You can make claims that 
you know, during the apostolic period, they had access to something we don't have. But for us today, the only thing that we can identify that is God speaking is Scripture. Now, in saying that the only thing we can identify as binding from the apostolic age, I'm not going to bite on God speaking, because I've already shown that that has a much broader meaning in Paul than it does in later theology. And so apostolic tradition was God speaking, including... I, I completely disagree. It's a complete equivocation. Yeah. Um, well, there are a lot of Protestant scholars like um, Bruce Metzger and F. Bruce, F. Bruce Metzger did not believe that Roman Catholic uh, apostolic tradition is the same thing as biblical apostolic. That's a non sequitur, and it's my question time, actually. Um, the, there are multiple Protestant scholars, including people like Lee McDonald, Bruce Metzger, and F.F. F. Bruce, and Auguste Le Cerf, who agree with me on inspiration was not viewed as limited to the scriptures, and it was broader than that. It was regarded by first century and other early Christians as applying to anything that wasn't manifestly heretical. Having said that, having said that... Um, yeah, I was going to ask if that was a question. Is Sola Scriptura something that needs to meet its own test in order to be successful? Uh, yes, and it does. Okay. Where, then, without presupposing sola scriptura... So presuppose the negation of my position. I'm not getting uh, into that kind no, no, of no. game. No, no, no. I'm not saying presuppose <laughs> the negation. I'm just saying don't assume it. Without assuming sola scriptura, because if you assume sola scriptura, then your argument is circular and it doesn't prove anything. And if scripture is God speaking... That is the ultimate authority, and there cannot be any demonstration of that ultimate authority outside of the ultimate authority itself. If you this want, is an epistemological if question. If you want to assume that Scripture is the Word of God, I'm all with you. So we don't need to fight it's not about an assumption. that. It's, it's teaching. But scripture. if you're assuming, so tell me this, are you assuming that there is nothing outside of Scripture that is also the Word of God, or do you have a basis for that that is not... That is yes. not simply your I'm, I'm not, own I'm not assuming anything. Views. I am simply saying Scripture tells me explicitly that Scripture is God speaking, not just 2 Timothy 3, but Jesus' statement to the Sadducees, have you not read what God spoke to you? And my statement is there is nothing else that you can point to or anyone else can point to that is God speaking that we do not possess within the covers of what God has given us in this great gift? Well, um, I have to say that I've already done that multiple times, like the fact that there is... That is that a question? I'm setting up a question. I get to respond to statements you make in this period, and, um, and I've already done that multiple times. You're just not acknowledging it. So let's shift the discussion a little bit. Um, as I mentioned... If you assume sola scriptura to prove sola scriptura, then your argument is circular and doesn't prove anything. So without assuming sola scriptura, no. can you show me that we no longer have any apostolic traditions like the ones I mentioned, such as the fact there will be no more apostles? Again, uh, I believe there will be no more apostles because the scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 1 we can make that application. So there is biblical revelation that we can make that application. I don't believe that that is some <clears throat> apostolic tradition that was passed down. If you think it was, then identify who the apostle was and who, passed, who did they pass it down to. In Hebrews 1, it never even, it says God spoke to our fathers in many various ways, but today mm -hmm. he's spoken to us by, our, by his son. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell us that there are not going to be any more apostles in the future. That's something that you're going way beyond the text for. No, I, I don't think that it is at all. In light of what the book of Hebrews was as an apologetic to tell people there's nothing to go back to, the completedness of the new covenant and the work of Christ is the very central aspect of what Hebrews chapter 1 is about. I just think you're not going deep enough into Hebrews 1. I would invite people to read Hebrews 1 and see whether it even mentions apostles. Um, say it did. I'm sorry? I didn't say it did. Well, okay, I think that injures your case. Uh, no, no, it does not. Uh, moving on to another question. You are in error. Um, so in 2 Timothy 3, Paul invokes apostolic tradition when he tells Timothy to hold fast to what he was taught. He then says that Timothy knows the sacred writings, which means the Old Testament in this case, and that they're able to instruct him for salvation through faith in Christ. So the Old Testament helps support faith in Christ, which at the time was in oral form. Uh, so you need apostolic tradition to correctly interpret the Old Testament regarding Christ. 
Do you acknowledge that in this passage, Paul is making a double appeal to both apostolic tradition and to scriptures approved by the apostles? No, sir. You've inserted the term apostolic tradition about four or five times in there where it's not found anywhere in the text whatsoever. It's equivocation. Uh, you keep using it. You have to keep using it, but it is an um, eisegetical move that uh, really results in a different perspective on the text, and it makes it teach something other than what Paul was intending it to teach uh, to the apostle, uh, to, to Timothy. So we know that the apostolic paradigm was willed by Christ for his first followers, and you've admitted that sola scriptura was not in use in the first century. That would mean either that all apostolic traditions have to get written down before the death of the last apostle so that they become scripture, mm -hmm. or it would mean they lose their authority after the death of the last apostle. No. No. Which of those options no. do you support? N neither one. It's a false question. Uh, the it's a true question. It I'll go ahead and answer it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the reality is the content of quote-unquote apostolic tradition is given to us in scripture. They cohere they do not have one body here and one body there that includes Marian dogmas, papacy, and everything else over here, and what we have in Scripture over here. They cohere, and that's why we continue to have them today. All right. Time has expired for cross-examination. Um, you guys didn't know this, Philip and Rusty, but you're in the camera shot behind Dr. White, so you can tell everybody hello who's watching. Um, if uh, They've been sorting the Q&A cards for me. We have over 100 cards and so i had to ask for their help i didn't realize there would be so many questions and do the q a afterward are you guys finished if they're not done okay well, well yeah we'll go ahead you, you, and you guys can continue to sort if you need to so these are for white and these are for aiken Okay, I'm going to do my best to give equal treatment. We do have more cards for Mr. Aiken and Mr. White, so if you guys can get me some more cards for Mr. White in a moment, and I'll get started with these. We'll start with Mr. Aiken. Uh, the question is, what is the reconciliation of papal infallibility with contradictory statements or established traditions between different popes? The uh, popes have exercised infallibility on a very small number of occasions. According to most scholars, there are only between six and eight documents where popes have exercised infallibility. In order for there to be a contradiction involving papal infallibility, it would have to be a contradiction between two or more of those six to eight documents, and none of those documents contradict each other. They may reject earlier things, that were non-infallible, but there's no contradiction involving papal infallibility if a pope rejects a prior non-infallible teaching. In order to generate a contradiction involving papal infallibility, you would need two infallible statements contradicting each other, and such a thing has never happened, and by the protection of the Holy Spirit, will never happen. All right, 30 seconds for Mr. White to respond. It seems to me that the whole concept of papal infallibility is probably the most useless doctrine I've ever heard, because fundamentally, as I've debated uh, Tim Staples, uh, Robertson Genis on these issues, uh, what I heard from them was the Pope is infallible except when he's not. So when you demonstrate uh, honorius or whatever else it might be, well, he just wasn't speaking infallibly. The problem is you never know when someone actually is speaking infallibly. There's always disagreement about it. That's the problem. All right, the next question will be from Mr. White. The question is, what source gave us the New Testament canon? Is this source God-breathed? This is a number of questions. And if not, uh, does this mean that the canon could contain non-infallible writings? Yeah, one minute to talk about the entirety of the canon. I will just simply recommend to everybody... You go, uh, James. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I would direct people to a conversation I had with Dr. Michael Kruger at G3, um, I think in 2018, where we discussed the fact that the canon is a theological uh, issue. It's not a historical issue. It is an artifact of revelation. And once you understand that it is the natural result of inspiration taking place, uh, then you'll understand uh, not only the historical realities behind the recognition, 
but also what happened in the intertestamental period with the recognition of what we would call the Old Testament canon as well. And so, no, uh, you do not have to have a quote-unquote infallible magisterial source. Rome didn't get around it until 1546. All the major issues had already been decided at that point, but uh, it is, in fact, an artifact of revelation, not an object of revelation. 30 seconds to respond. So just commenting on this, because James frequently brings up that uh, the Catholic Church didn't infallibly define the canon until the 1500s, there's a reason for that. If you're a Protestant and you're using sola scriptura, then what belongs in the Bible and what doesn't, having a precise knowledge of that, is an urgent priority. Because if you include even one book in there that's not scripture or omit one book that is scripture, then you've got a huge problem if you're limited to Sola Scriptura. But if God is guiding you overall in turn, and you're not limited to Sola Scriptura, this is much less of a priority. And so it wasn't until a major group challenging the canon appeared that the church felt a need to infallibly define it. All right, the next question is for Mr. Aiken. The question is, how can we trust apostolic tradition that has been handed down orally when the Roman Catholic Church has repeatedly overruled or redefined previous tradition? Okay, well, not all tradition is apostolic tradition. We covered that. And so, consequently, um, if the Roman Catholic Church overrules prior tradition in an infallible way, well, then it wouldn't have been apostolic. It would have been something else. Uh, in terms of how can we trust it, it's because the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are guiding his church. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth, and Jesus himself said that as the church is making disciples and teaching them everything he's, he commanded us, he's with us until the end of the age. And so that fundamental guidance of the church by Christ and by the Holy Spirit is something that gives us confidence in the authorities that he's instituted in his own church. So there's a good example of sola ecclesia. Um, if the church says it, then it's true, and we can simply trust that because we say Christ is with us. Well, we believe Christ is with his church, but we recognize that Christ was with the Corinthian church, and they needed a lot of correction, and that has been seen down through the history of the church. Anyone who, I teach church history, and you, could, you, you see the number of times that the church has erred in its traditions. It's all through history. Next question for Mr. White. You said that the canon was not defined by Catholicism until 1546. When was it defined for other Christians? How was it decided and who decided it? Well, again, it, it'd be great to have a discussion of, of canon issues. It's, it's far too much information in 54 seconds. But uh, the reality is that there were two traditions. As far as the New Testament is concerned, there was very, very, very little disagreement. Yes, Revelation had to fight to get in, things like that, that's true. But the major argument, and we've done debates on this subject, go listen to the debates I've done with, with a number of people on this subject of the uh, apocryphal books. Uh, the major difference between us is in those books, and when you look at that, there's two traditions that went all the way to the time of the Reformation. You had popes, uh, you had Jerome, you had all sorts of people who rejected those books as the Jews had rejected those books. And then you had another tradition, primarily people who followed the Greek Septuagint, not knowing the Hebrew background, uh, who accepted the apocryphal books. And then you have, with the Reformation, you have this finality at the Council of Trent that takes one of those traditions and establishes it. So, um, as, uh, as I was just mentioning, this was, this gives me a little more time to expand on this, um, this was something that was not an urgent priority for the Catholic Church because when doctrinal controversies arose, it could resort to more than just Scripture itself. It could resort to apostolic tradition that had been passed down. It could consult the magisterium if there was a severe problem. It was, therefore, not an urgent priority to figure out exactly the parameters of Scripture, but for someone who believes in sola scriptura, it is an urgent priority. All right, the next question for Mr. Aiken. If you believe that there is no more revelation, by what source of truth or authority is the Pope considered inerrant? Uh, okay, so there's a difference between something being revealed by God and something being inerrant. Um, 
the Pope does not receive new revelations from God. Instead, what happens is God protects him from teaching error. Uh, it's kind of like if someone gave you a math test and God guided you so that you got every question on that correct. Well, that's not new revelation. It wasn't like God was helping you cheat and whispering answers in your ear. Instead, he guided you in such a way that you didn't make any mistakes. And in limited situations, that applies to the Pope. God guides him in such a way that he, makes lim he doesn't make mistakes in those specific situations, which, as I mentioned, are very rare. Now, there's actually an open question about how God does that. It could be he would recall the Pope to heaven if he were about to make an error. But one way or another, he protects the Pope from teaching error to his church when the Pope is trying to engage in fallibility. 30 seconds. Recall to heaven. Boom. <laughs> I was being funny polite way, about funny it. Funny way of putting it, yeah. Um, I would simply point out that Pope Honorius was anathematized as a heretic for his teachings by every person who took the throne of Peter in Rome for four hundred years by name. Those people clearly did not believe in papal infallibility. All right. If you guys will bring me the rest of those cards while I'm asking the next question, I appreciate that. Just send them right here. Um, Mr. White, the next question is for you. Who has the authority to interpret scripture and what do we do when differing interpretations are attributed to the illumination of the Holy Spirit? Uh, to, to the what? Illumination. Oh, I thought you said elimination. I'm like, Illumina <laughs> it's a new <laughs> doctrine I've never heard before. <laughs> yeah, so if we'll reset the timer for 60 seconds, I'll read the question one more time. Okay. Who has the authority to interpret Scripture, and what do we do when differing interpretations are attributed to the illumination of the Holy Spirit? i got to remember I'm in Louisiana. Okay, so, <laughs> yes, well, uh, and, and this, is, this is a case of interpreting any written document. This is, you get... Look at all the different interpretations just of the recent uh, papal document, too. You've got all sorts of different takes on that. Um, the reality is that uh, I do believe that Christ promised to be with his church. And when it comes to things that define the gospel, we have had great consistency. In fact, I'll make this argument. People who believe in sola scriptura and seek to practice it are much more united on who God is and what the gospel is than any religions that claim that the Bible is not enough and they bring something else in to help interpret it. There is much more consistency between us than everybody else who brings in other authorities outside of Scripture. And so uh, does that mean we all have the same opinion on everything? No, it's not. That will come, I think, eventually. 30 seconds. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that there's so much unity between Protestants who um, believe in Sola Scriptura and take it seriously. That's very heartening to hear. We're going to hear a lot more about unity tomorrow night, but uh, there are some noticeable differences between people who claim to be using Sola Scriptura seriously in the Protestant community concerning salvation. Like, do you need to get baptized to be saved? Some say yes, some say no. Do you need to baptize babies? Some say yes, some say no. All right, the next question will be for Mr. Aiken. Concerning 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul wrote, what you heard from me. What are the contents of what Timothy heard from Paul outside of Scripture? Well, every time Paul was speaking to Timothy on a doctrinal nature, uh, on subjects of a doctrinal nature, and wasn't just quoting from the Old Testament, he was communicating to him information that is apostolic tradition, and that would include things that are now in Scripture, but it is not limited to things that are now in Scripture, as I demonstrated earlier, like the fact there are not going to be any more apostles. That's not in Scripture, but it is something that uh, we both recognize also. The close of public revelation is not there, and the identity of the restrainer that's holding back the man of lawlessness is not there. But Timothy would have heard Paul preach on these subjects. 30 seconds. Um, let, let, let's keep something in mind. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, by the end of the second century, said that he had apostolic tradition, that Jesus was more than 50 years old when he died. 
And he fit that in with his recapitulation theory of the atonement. Now, I don't know anybody who actually agrees with that today, but you have to have a means to look at anything that's written by an early father and examine it to see whether it's actually true. Scripture becomes the standard for that. Mr. White, a question for you. How do you explain all the different doctrines and beliefs that the tens of thousands of Protestant denominations have? I love the tens of thousands of Protestant denominations. We've debunked that one for a long time. According to the very same source that people get the 35,000, 43,000, there are like 1,400 Roman Catholic churches too. So be careful what sources you're using. Uh, there's, there's very, very a much smaller number uh, than that of any type of serious size whatsoever. How do you explain that? Real simple, people not following sola scriptura. People bring their own traditions, their own ignorances, whatever it might be, but yes, that is the primary reason. As I said earlier, the groups that believe in sola scriptura and practice it are very close in their perspectives with one another, especially on who God is, I can go out and debate Muslims with them and everything else. The people who reject it and bring in traditions and revelations and quote-unquote apostolic traditions, they end up with all sorts of different perspectives. That's an important thing to keep in mind. All right, 30 seconds. So I'm going to please you, James, by admitting that we need to be careful about exaggerating the number of Christian groups. These numbers like 35,000 Protestant denominations and stuff are reckoned according to a bad system of mathematics. Uh, they shouldn't be counted that way. Although I would say it's not 1,400, but 230 different Catholic churches okay. in that source. Um, so I agree with that. And I would also agree that the differences, or depending on how you would say this, agree that it is sola scriptura that has led to the differences among the different groups because scripture underdetermines certain questions and that leads to divergences of opinion. All right, time's expired. Uh, guys, if you will bring me some more cards while I ask the next question because I'm almost out. Um, Mr. Aiken, the next question is for you. Oh. What is an yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. What I'm do you say to, the, to hear it? I'm sorry. I'm trying to I told multitask. You it'd be hard here. to multitask these things. All right. Uh, so Mr. Aiken, this question for you. What do you say to the pope when he contradicts the scriptures? Is this acceptable to you? Well, it's not acceptable for anybody to contradict the scriptures. And so if any pope, Francis or anybody else, was contradicting the scriptures, uh, then, and I you know, looked at it and said, yeah, there's just no way to reconcile these statements, then I would get him on speed dial and I would say, hey, bud, think you want to walk that one back? <laughs> Finished? Yep. <laughs> All right. 30 seconds. I would love to see exactly how that works, personally. <laughs> I didn't know you had Francis on the speed dial. Um, and something tells me getting hold of him would be a little bit more difficult than that. And though you are Jimmy Aiken and you do wear a cowboy hat, I'm just not sure that would be enough uh, to actually get you to that point. And my point is, I, if the Pope is functioning infallibly, you don't have a way to take that position. All right, Mr. White, the next question is for you. You stated that you have to have a scriptura in order to have a sola. Mm -hmm. The canon of scripture was not set definitively until centuries after the apostolic age. How then is sola scriptura not a binding tradition surfacing after the apostolic age? Well, again, it'd be a great debate to have, but I would just like to point to the question. I've been asking uh, Roman Catholics for a long time, especially since I debated uh, Jerry Matatix at Boston College in 93. And that is, how did the believing Jewish man, 50 years before Christ, know that Isaiah and Second Chronicles were Scripture? What was the mechanism? Because Jesus held men accountable to those Scriptures. And they never said, oh, I didn't know that was Scripture. So how did they know? They had no infallible magisterium. And in fact, the Jews rejected the books that the Council of Trent added to the canon. So how did they know? There had to have been a mechanism. And I don't believe that the Roman Catholic system can explain how they can know that specifically. So there has to be a process process 
of recognition passively over time, not an active definition. 30 seconds. So I'll answer your question about how they knew. They didn't. There was no infallible determination of the canon prior to the time of Christ. And there were differences in the Jewish community about which books counted as scripture and which didn't. So this was a question that simply had not been answered yet definitively. Those books, Jesus held people accountable to the books that they recognized as scripture, but he didn't hold other people accountable to books that they did not recognize as scripture, such as when he debated with the Sadducees. All right. Um, Mr. Aiken, the next question is for you, and I don't know that you can do this in 60 seconds, but if you can give us a general answer. James has been pressed. I'll do my best to. Could you please offer a brief history of the canon of Scripture? Uh, <laughs> this is just payback, right? Especially <laughs> Who are you? What's wrong with you so people? I, can, I'll can pull you, an R.C. Sproul here. Let me, let me reformulate <laughs> the question in a, in a way that maybe you can answer in 60 seconds. How did the church formulate the canon? Is that your perspective? And if so, how okay. did it do it? So the canon is intrinsically authoritative because God wrote it. But in terms of how he guided the church into a, rec- into a recognition of which books are canonical and which books are not, the basic criterion was what did the apostles approve? And that's something that the church discerned by two, a twofold test involving tradition. When they looked at books that were proposed for inclusion in Scripture, and there were a lot, a lot more than most people are aware, they asked two questions. The first question was, is there a history or tradition of this book being read in the churches? If there was a tradition of it being read in the churches, that was a mark in its favor. The second question was, does it agree with the traditions passed down from the apostles? In other words, does it agree with Christian doctrine that has been passed down since the time of the apostles? If the answer to that was also yes, then it was generally recognized as apostolically approved and having come from the apostles. If it failed either of those, it was rejected. 30 seconds. Romans chapter 3, verse 2, and it says, what's the advantage of the Jew? It says, great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And so vitally important, especially in the one area where uh, the two sides here completely disagree on the issue of the canon, the deuterocanonical books, Those books were not accepted by the Jews. They were rejected. And yet scripture says they were the ones entrusted with the oracles of God. That should be the primary standard. Mr. White, the next question for you, you mentioned purgatory not being in scripture. What about 2 Maccabees 12, 43 to 46? (laughs) Hey, you picked on me. Now's my turn. I think we debated the wrong topic here this evening. So... Uh, obviously, uh, not only do I not uh, believe that uh, this is canon scripture, there were popes that didn't believe it's canon scripture either. Um, and what's more, these individuals had idols on their bodies. Idolatry is a, and again, this is complete anachronism to read categories of venial and mortal sin back into this context. It's, it's just absurd. Um, but since it's used this way, Uh, The reality is that this would have been a mortal sin and the whole concept of purgatory would be irrelevant to pray for them because they were idolaters, for crying out loud. Um, So, again, it it, it seems to me that um, during the issues of the Reformation, this got a whole lot more attention than it might have otherwise uh, in more calmer periods of time. Uh, But it certainly has has no uh, connection whatsoever to the, the concept of purgatory. I'm so glad this question was asked because it gives me an opportunity to respond something to something you said in one of your rebuttals where I am not allowed to counter rebut. But um, you're supposed to be commenting on the question. <laughs> but I am going to comment on the question because this question asks about Second Maccabees, and that allows me to point out that James's assertions that the canon was known by the Jews who possessed the oracles of God. Well, it's true. They possessed the oracles of God, but that doesn't mean that all of them had an accurate understanding of what those oracles were. In fact, the Sadducees did not. There was disagreement, and some Jews regarded 2 Maccabees as Scripture. All right. The next question for Mr. Aiken. In regards to 2 Thessalonians 2.15, how do you know that what traditions are spoken of in that text are not either later scripture, uh, are not either later scripture, uh, and inscripturated later. Yes, 
Oh, 60 seconds. That's it? Okay. Um, well, I devoted a whole slide to this uh, during my presentation. Um, first of all, I can't assume one way or another that they are all identical with what's later written down, and I can't assume that they're not. I need evidence. So I provided evidence by pointing out that Paul did not have time, because he was in, in Thessalonica for less than a month, to give them a full course of instruction in the faith. So he can't be talking about that as the traditions he gave them. Also, I pointed to the fact that he says they already know what the restrainer is because he says, remember, I told you what the restrainer is. But he doesn't record it here, and it's not recorded elsewhere in Scripture. So obviously, some of the things that he taught them in that three-week period were not later written down in Scripture. So there was apostolic tradition outside of what we now have in the New Testament. 30 seconds. Second Thessalonians 2.13 says, We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. So in context, what is he referring to? He's referring to the content of the gospel that has been delivered to them in two ways. Mr. White, the next question for you. If two people are reading scripture and they get conflicting interpretations, who are they supposed to go to if you believe in sola scriptura? Who are they to go to? Well, if they're involved in a good, solid church, which the New Testament tells us has multiple elders and deacons in it, and that's the only form of the church the New Testament uh, even begins to understand, uh, then they should talk to their elders about it. Uh, that would be the first thing. Uh, and what if you have a difference between elders? Well, then they need to go much more deeply into the text of Scripture. And I don't have any problem whatsoever in their going into church history and reading Augustine or, or reading Gottschalk or, or reading whoever they want to read. That's fine and dandy as long as you do not invest in their words and authority and a tradition outside of Scripture. But the fact of the matter is, in this life, there are going to remain differences between individuals until the fullness is brought in, and that gets into, that's into eschatology, and I can't do that with Brian sitting here. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have that debate later, Dr. Dwight, over, over some tacos. All right, 30 seconds. I agree with James that in, for ordinary purposes, um, you know, we have to do the best we can in our situation. And talking to one's, the presbyters, the priests or elders or whatever you want to call them in your church are, is a good first step. And speaking from a Catholic perspective, if you don't get satisfaction there, you can take it up to the bishop. And ultimately, you could go to the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith or even the pope. But that's very unlikely to happen in a practical case. What the Catholic system does have that, unfortunately, the Protestant system doesn't, is the possibility of getting a definitive answer. And that's a good thing. You don't have Tucho on speed dial? No, I just have Francis. Oh, okay. You, you just go for the top. Let's not worry about the lower people. Okay. All right. Next question, Mr. Aiken. Are Protestants anathematized according to the Council of Trent? Ooh. We're spoiling tomorrow night's talk. The answer is no, they're not. Uh, as I'll explain tomorrow night, um, the term anathema does not mean what many in the Protestant community think it does. I'll show you exactly what it did mean and I'll show you the status of uh, anathemas today. The, so spoiler warning, everybody, no Protestants are not anathematized. Let's hear it for everybody who's not anathematized. So be happy about that, but I want you to come back tomorrow night, so I, I'll explain the reasoning tomorrow. But the good news is nobody here is anathematized. Dr. White, 30 seconds. Well, I'd like to join in all the fun, but the fact of the matter is uh, a steady stream of missionaries came out of the Church of Geneva uh, in the 1500s going into Italy to bring the gospel of grace there, and every single one of them was murdered. So you can play with the term anathema all you want. The historical reality was it led to bloodshed. All right, Mr. White, the next question, 
Prior to Luther, where does the doctrine of sola scriptura appear in Christian writing? I've written uh, an entire chapter in a book called Sola Scriptura that I think is currently published by Soli Deo Gloria, where I went rather in-depth into the patristic witness up through, I think I stopped with Athanasius, if I recall correctly, uh, but I provided a number of texts uh, that uh, present to us a viewpoint utterly different than what you have in modern Roman Catholicism in regards to not only the nature of Scripture, but the sufficiency of Scripture uh, to uh, determine these issues. And I would simply point out that when it's said that no one back then was concerned about the canon uh, because they had other things to refer to, let me point out, that is baldly false. The church's greatest struggle back then was with Gnosticism, and the Gnostics did dispute the canon, and that was in the second and third centuries. You bet they had a reason to know what the canon was. 30 seconds. So they did when it came to the Gnostics, but, and they quickly rejected all of the Gnostic writings because they were heretical. They failed to pass the two tradition tests that I mentioned. So they rejected them, but they didn't need to define everything because there wasn't an urgent priority to get everything defined. Having said that, since you just brought back something else I mentioned, um, yeah, there were some missionaries who went to Italy and got killed. There were a bunch of missionaries who were Catholic who went to England and got killed. So if you want to play that game, we can. All right, Mr. Anathema. Mr. Aiken, the last question will be for you. How does Rome land on such things like blessing same-sex marriage when the Bible directly opposes such a thing? It doesn't. The Catholic Church does not support blessing same-sex marriages. That's the simple answer to the question. Okay, 30 seconds. Uh, I agree. That's, that's not what was said. But what was said, if, we, if you've watched how the LGBTQ movement has moved through the liberal Protestant denominations, it's what's happening in the Vatican. You kick the door open just a little bit. You open it just a little bit, then a little bit more, then a little bit more, and a little bit more. I just don't believe that anyone can believe that any pope before only 20 years ago could ever have gone where Francis has gone with this. They just, they, they, I just can't believe it. All right. If you'll give us just a minute, we are going to reset the stage for closing statements. So if we can get the podium back in place. Okay. Each debater has five minutes to make his closing statement. This will be the last portion of the debate. Dr. White, five minutes. Just a second. We've got, we got wires up here. Yeah, don't start the timer until he begins. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, the church here for bringing us together, providing the uh, opportunity. It, it takes a lot of work to put these things together for Jimmy Aiken for driving down uh, to be here uh, and engage this very important subject. I want to emphasize that we have heard assertions that, well, th this, is, this is what apostolic tradition is. And I know in church history that term has been used of all sorts of things, many of which Mr. Aiken would not accept as actually having come from the apostles. But the reality is we have not been shown anything that is truly theanustos, God-breathed, that is outside of Scripture. Nothing. And we certainly have not been given anything that would be a foundation for the massive developments of theology in sacramentalism, in the Marian dogmas, in the development of church offices and ecumenical councils and conciliarism and the pap papacy. We've been giving nothing that you could in any meaningful way trace back to the apostles historically. You couldn't do it. It's not possible. And so my first assertion remains really, literally, unchallenged. And that is, if you, what Paul said to Timothy, and Timothy's going to be facing, Timothy, hard times are coming, apostasy's coming, false teachers are coming. Just look to Peter in Rome. That's not what he said. When he met with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, what did he say, what did he say to them? There are going to be many people who rise from your very ranks. And draw disciples away. I therefore commit you to God and to the word of his grace. 
not to a magisterium, not to apostolic tradition, but to God's word. And you can make arguments that, well, but there's a time where, you know, some people don't know. That's fine. Happened in the Old Testament, too. And Jesus did hold men accountable every time. You can say, well, with the Sadducees, he went ahead and just quoted the Pentateuch. And there's argument about exactly where they were on that. But that's fine. How, when he cites the book of Isaiah, did someone know it was Scripture? No one ever responded to Jesus by saying, well, that's not Scripture. How did they know? And he said, they didn't. And I just sat there looking out over you, going, I'm hoping everyone's still awake at this point. Because he just said, they didn't know. Jesus said, have you not read what God spoke to you? Well, I didn't know God spoke that to you. That doesn't work. That does not work. And so if you've been listening carefully to the use of the phrase apostolic tradition, you have found that apostolic tradition, as it's been used by Jimmy tonight, is a Gumby and some of you are too young to know what Gumby was, and I feel sorry for you. I know. But Gumby, see? Well, of course you know. Um, <laughs> Gumby was a, was a little figure back in my day that you could stretch all sorts of different directions, and he was quite flexible. A whole lot more flexible than I am anymore, I can guarantee you that. But you see, for apostolic tradition to be meaningful and to ground dogma that you say you must believe de fide it has to it has to actually refer to something that really came from the apostles and we have been given no reason to believe that the things that rome has bound upon men's consciences actually come from any apostle at all the default if you simply read the scriptures let me ask you to do something, whether you're Roman Catholic or Protestant tonight. Go home and read the 119th Psalm. It's a long one. Might put you to sleep. But read the 119th Psalm. And listen to the psalmist speak of the exalted nature of God's law and God's testimonies. And realize he didn't have anything in comparison to what we have today. He didn't have Ephesians. He didn't have John. And yet, listen to what the scripture says and ask yourself a simple question. Is there anything in this world that could be described in the words that the psalmist uses to speak of God's testimonies in scripture in the 119th Psalm? And the answer is no. And that establishes sola scriptura. Thank you for your attention this evening. God bless. So James mentioned a number of things that I have provided no basis for, like purgatory and conciliarism and the papacy and the Marian doctrines and all these different things. And he said, and it can't be done. Well, not in my last five minutes it can't. That's overloading again. If you wanted to debate those subjects, you should ask for a different debate topic. So I'm going to stay focused on what we're here to talk about tonight, which is the principles. And in... The apostolic age, they used the apostolic paradigm. It included apostolically approved scriptures, including the Old Testament. It included apostolic tradition that went beyond what was in the Old Testament. And it included a magisterium or teaching authority that God himself had instituted and was guiding such that they, the members of that magisterium could say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to announce this decision. And we also see the New Testament, like in 2 Timothy, talking about how the junior members of the community are to pass on apostolic tradition after the apostles are dead. Paul names four generations to do that. His own, which began the apostolic tradition, Timothy's, the generation Timothy will teach, and the generation they will teach. So the New Testament envisions the apostolic paradigm continuing in the post-apostolic age. And it did. I've shown you four apostolic traditions that we agree on that are authoritative in the Protestant community just like they're authoritative in the Catholic community. I could have shown many more, even though there might be differences with some Protestants. But I've already shown that these are binding on us today, and they also are theopneustos.
they are God-breathed because the early church had a different concept of what inspiration is than what James is reading into the text. The big problem with sola scriptura is that it holds that all teachings, all doctrines, must be taught either explicitly or implicitly in Scripture. James has admitted it's a doctrine. Sola Scriptura is a doctrine. Therefore, if Sola Scriptura is true, Sola Scriptura must be taught in Scripture. But it is not taught in Scripture. As James has also admitted, it was not operational in the first century. Therefore, no Bible verses teach Sola Scriptura. First century Christians were not being told to use it. Sola Scriptura is therefore a post-biblical inference based on the idea that we no longer have apostolic tradition or a divinely guided magisterium. And we've seen that those claims are false. Therefore, Sola Scriptura fails its own test. And we should continue to use the apostolic paradigm that the apostles expected their converts to use. And just like all of the Christian groups that precede the Reformation have continued to use. So in very quick summary, the apostolic paradigm was Jesus's will for his first followers. It was never rescinded. Jesus promised that he and the Holy Spirit would guide his church forever in its teaching. The New Testament speaks of passing down apostolic tradition in the post-apostolic age, and God guided the magisterium into inerrant decisions hundreds of years after the time of Christ. On the other hand, Sola Scriptura was not Jesus' will for his first followers, as James has admitted. It is never taught in the New Testament, either for Jesus' first followers or for his later followers. It is based on false post-apostolic premises. For example, it falsely claims that we don't have extra-scriptural apostolic tradition. When we do, we agree on it. And it is thus self-refuting because it fails its own test. I offer this for your consideration. Thank you so much, everybody, and thanks for coming out tonight. Well, thank you to both of our debaters. As we close our debate tonight, uh, Mr. Aiken is going to be at the Catholic Answers table in the foyer. Uh, Mr. White will be up here at the front if you'd like to speak to him. I want to close this in a word of prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come tonight thankful for this opportunity for us to interact with one another, consider your word and its authority. And Lord, I just pray tonight that you would help each of us to discern your truth, Lord, your gospel. I pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would uh, truly help us to uh, find your truth. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, keep everyone safe as they drive home. As we come tomorrow, that you would continue to bless uh, these debates, Lord, we just thank you so much for all of the um, all of the interest in this and this historic attendance at this event. Lord, we are so thankful, and in that we pray in the Lord Jesus' name, Amen. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.